next week will be actually what this lesson will be about, or we'll have one more week lighting candles. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about where, where we've come from. The first Sunday of Advent was the purple uh, candle that we looked at. It was the hope candle, which is also the prophecy candle. We also studied in Isaiah the prophecy that was foretold of the coming of Jesus Christ. Am I hearing voices or what? Yeah. I can get you on there if you want me. I'm not, I'm not saying nothing. Okay. All right. So then the second Sunday of Advent, another purple candle we lit, was for the faith candle. And that's known as the Bethlehem candle. And so that's what we lit uh, the second week of Advent. Today was the third Sunday of Advent, and we lit the pink candle, which is a candle that stands for joy. And the candle is also known as the shepherd's candle. And then what we're going to be studying about tonight is the fourth Sunday of Advent is the purple candle, which is known as the peace candle. And it is called the angel's candle. And uh, I always get such a kick out of when we had those kids come forward today as angels to follow up. Because you think about when the scripture talked about that heavenly bunch of angels coming down. And, and uh, that always gets me kind of fired up. So mm -hmm. about that. But then there will be one more candle lit on that fifth Sunday, and that'll be on, that will actually be for Christmas, and that's the purity candle, the white candle, which is the Christ candle. And I kind of more or less I didn't really get this, but I made my own thing on this. To me, that's the love candle. And the reason I say it's the love candle, in John 3.16, it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the true love candle, because he loved us that much to be part of his creation, bring us into the world. That's how important we are, because he created us. So you have importance. God wouldn't have created you if he didn't want you here. And it's up to us to do what God wants us to do or try to follow his path. So that's, that's kind of a little... Um, a briefing on where we've been. So the question they want me to start with tonight is, how would you describe yourself? What names or descriptions do you think are true, true of you? Now, I'm gonna, I'll start, I'm gonna start this one because uh, when they talk about names, back in high school, I had a Ford Torino GT Fastback 1974 Torino GT Fastback. And it sounded like it had a turban. When it went down the road, it sounded like it had a turban. So either they'd call me Tom, Tommy Turban <laughs> or Two Ten Tommy and his tank, something like that. So that was some of the names I got out of that deal. But I, I did win a lot of drag races with that car. So, but, uh, but that's kind of, that was kind of a, uh, my description or the description I kind of went by and Tinker was for some reason I got stuck with Tinker we even had a yeah, in fact I call her creep from another church she's that creep on my phone and she's always called me Tinker and I don't know how she found out I think Kathy must have told her they called me Tinker or something but <laughs> you must have let that out <laughs> you must have let that out so uh, but I don't really know how I got the tinker part, but anyway, that, that was there, so whatever. I lived with it, and I'm still here today. So yeah. it didn't kill me, and, and the, the turbine Torino didn't kill me either, which I came close a couple times. But, but anyway, so how would you describe yourself if you're willing to share? And what names or descriptions do you think are true of you? That's kind of hard to do, but of yourself. Yeah, really. But I would say mom, grandma, friend, mom, grandma, yeah. teacher. Those are all Steve. pretty good. You don't make bad cinnamon rolls either. <laughs> <laughs> I want that recipe. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay. Anybody else? Well, you know, they used to call me chicken fingers. Chicken <laughs> fingers. <laughs> when I bowled, that's a long story. I, uh, it had nothing really to do with chicken, but I was eating one night when I was bowling out of town, and I I can't say I've never thrown a gutter ball, but 
normally when I'm bowling in a tournament, I don't throw better ball. But this night I ate steak and I didn't have a fork, so I picked it up on my hand. Wow. And started eating it. And then it was my turn to bowl. Well, dumb me, I didn't wipe my hand off. Yeah. And when I got up there and started to throw the ball, it just slid right off and went in the gutter. So my brother said, well, there went chicken fingers. And I said, how in the world did you come up with that? Well, I was called that for a long time after that. Even when I bowled the last time I bowled, however long ago it was, 30-some years ago, when I did, I stopped bowling. Well, when the Lord came into my life, I gave up bowling because of the, all the stuff. The other stuff that there. went with bowling. Huh? All the other stuff that went with bowling. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's why I gave it up. <clears throat> but anyhow, that thank you. Do that. <laughs> that was a long story short. Okay. <laughs> but isn't it sad that you have to give up them things just because you don't party? Well, the temptation was right. the yeah. reason yeah. I gave it up. Right. Because when you're an alcoholic, the worst thing you could do is go back to what you came from. And that's one thing I promised the Lord that I would not do was drink again. And that's the only way I could make sure I did. My perfect game would be both. Just one. But I've had two 299s. We still have one perfect game. Yeah. I got the lean to hold the two. <laughs> chicken fingers and all. <laughs> yeah. Chicken fingers. Chicken fingers. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but I have a nickname. I'm Chatty, and I know that surprises everybody. <laughs> Did you get that from your dad or no? Well, that, that's where I was. I'm yeah, just kidding. I did. When my dad was dying mm -hmm. in the hospital, Mm -hmm. My nurse came in and said, Mrs. Tucker, this is there something I can do for you? And she said, not unless you can sit by a minute and talk in a second. We like my daughter. <laughs> 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 uh, it fits. Yeah. <laughs> Chatty Kathy. <laughs> Good. When I got to my final command, one of my first final commands in the service, me and a couple other guys were sitting around and we were you know, talking about each other and where we came from. Mm -hmm. They asked me where I was from, and I said, well, I went from Illinois. And the one guy named Daniel, and Daniel said, well, isn't that where they, everybody got the middle name of Bob, like Jim Bob? <laughs> John Bob. Bob. <laughs> I think that was Lynn Bob. And then they shortened it to G Bob. <laughs> no, I think G Bob. Anyone else daring? Mm -hmm. Mark and I are coal miners. So Mark knows you have a lot of names. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good or bad. Please, yeah. please don't share some don't of them. You don't want to repeat it here. You can't share none of them. Uh, but I worked for her dad. He was the boss. And they called me the hammer. <laughs> he had me probably work harder, five different jobs than anybody else. I'd always have to go shovel bar legs or go out the feeder and shovel. All the hard jobs because he didn't want to feel like he was giving me special treatment. Yeah. Well, he gave me the treatment and it wasn't special. <laughs> JR. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. He just couldn't get rid of you. Huh? No, I couldn't get rid of me. She made sure of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Well, tonight we're going to look at, in this series, we're going to be looking at the different names of Jesus. What well, J.D. calls the names of salvation, in all his names, we find new ways to celebrate and be thankful that, thankful for Jesus. But in the final name, I am, we find that God is the source of everything we could ever need. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, I tried to find you a... Uh, uh, I got a thing on my wall that gives you all the names of God. Jehovah Jireh is one I keep on my work wall uh, at work, and uh, but I, I just love all those old Hebrew names and whatnot. And so, but I couldn't find a source that was was an easy copy for you, and so I didn't get it done for you. So we'll take a look at this short video, and uh, it might be a short night tonight. So I don't know. I used to have one of those lists too, Tom, but I don't know what I've done with it. I, well, I still got one of one of my Bibles. Yeah, I, just I got one on my wall down in my office, yeah. but it was kind of kind of beat up, so it wasn't 
So bear with me as we go to right now video. Hit the home button. The what? The little house on there. The little house. Turn it wild, Kato. Mm. Mm. You might have to open the door <laughs> to the house. angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And God said, I am the God of your father. I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. Now go. Moses said to God, Suppose I go and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask, What is his name? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say. I am has sent me. In this series, we've been looking at some of the names that God used for the coming of the Messiah. Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father. These are the names of salvation. These are names that give us victory, that, that, that fill us with hope and strength and security. In this session, our last session, I want to look at the name behind all the other names of God. And that's the name I am. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh, or maybe you've heard its Latin equivalent, Jehovah. It's the name that God uses for himself over 6,500 times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible alone. I am was the name that God would use with Israel whenever they were in need. I am, Jehovah. He would then follow up the I am with some word that encapsulated whatever they needed. What it meant was that whatever they lacked in life, whatever they were deficient in, he could and would supply in himself. For example, in the book of Exodus, when the, when the people of Israel were sick because of their sin, God called himself Jehovah Rapha. Literally, <laughs> I am your healer. In the book of Leviticus, when Moses laid out the law, that description of how to, to walk uprightly and holy before God, the people said, who could ever live this way? And God answered with Jehovah Makedesh King. I am your sanctifier. I am the God who enables you to walk with me. I am your strength and your courage. I am your power for living. When the prophet Jeremiah was discouraged by Israel's persistent inability to walk faithfully before God, and he called out in despair, how can we survive? How can we survive? We are so sinful and weak. God declared, Jehovah tis kidnu. I am your righteousness. In the prophet Ezekiel's day, when the, the people of Israel felt scared and alone and, and besieged by enemies all around, God said to them, Jehovah Shammah, I am the ever-present one. When King David felt lost and confused with no friends, seemingly no friends left in the world, he called God Jehovah Ra. You are my shepherd. 
to Abraham, who faced an impossible circumstance with no way out, God revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh. Literally, I am your provider. And to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, who wasn't sure how he or the nation of Israel could survive even another day, God said, Jehovah Sabaoth, I am your defender. I am the God who fights for you. And here's where it gets really interesting. You see, with Jesus, the promised Messiah, the, the manifestation of God on earth, when he came to live among us, just like Isaiah prophesied, he did the exact same thing that God did in the Hebrew scriptures. He took the name of God, I am, and he applied it to whatever we needed to, to our greatest areas of brokenness and pain. For example, to those who hunger, Jesus said in John 6, I am the bread of life. To those who thirst, he says, John 7, let him come to me and drink, for I am the living water. To those in darkness, Jesus declares, John 8, I am the light. To those who need a fresh start, John 10, he says, I am the door. To those who feel abandoned, he says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. To those who feel lost, John 14, I am the way. To those confused, I am the truth. To those who are afraid of death, I am the life. You see, all that you need, all that you lack, all that you can never be in yourself, Jesus is to you as the great I am. So see, I've got two concluding questions for you from this, from this whole series. First, to those who know Jesus, are you living in the fullness of his name? You know, the third commandment out of the Ten Commandments tells us not to take the name of the Lord in vain. I, I always thought that that meant don't use God's name as a swear word, and, and that's certainly true. But the command specifically is not just about how to speak God's name. The command is about how to take God's name. You see, when you became a Christian, you, you took the name of God unto yourself. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, became God with you. He united himself to you. And see, that means that whatever the I am is, has become yours. Think of it like this. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful girl named Veronica Marie McPeters, and on the, the greatest day of her earthly life, she stood at an altar with me, and she became a Greer, my last name. When she was united to me in marriage, she took my last name, and all that was mine became hers, and all that was hers became mine. Unfortunately for her, it, it, it wasn't very much. We see, in the same way, when you became a Christian, you took the name of God to yourself, the name I am. And that means that the properties of the I am, in one sense, became your possession as well. What he is, you now have access to. The Apostle Peter says that you have become a participant in the divine nature. The Apostle Paul says you became an inheritor in him of all the divine promises. All the promises of God are yes for you in Christ Jesus. And that means that whatever you're not, whatever you need, whatever you lack, Whatever you're not getting from somebody else, to you, he says, I am. You say, but God, I, I am so messed up. He says, yes, but I am so complete. You say, I am so deficient. And he replies, but I am so sufficient. You say, I am so doubtful. He replies, but I am so faithful. You say, I am so sinful. He says, but I am so graceful. You say, I am so weak. And he says, but I am so strong. So see, believe him, take his name, and do not take it in vain. Stand in its strength. And when the doubters and the haters in your life say to you, who do you think you are? You respond, well, I don't think that I'm anything, but I know the great I am. And when our own hearts whisper to us, you are not, we shout back, you are right. But he is, and I am in him. The I am, Christ in us, Paul says, that is our hope of glory. The I am in me is my power for living. So again, first question, to those of you who know Jesus, are you living in the fullness of his name? Second question is to those of you who do not know Jesus, or at least you're not sure that you do. My question for you is, are you ready to receive him, to believe on these names that have been offered to you? In fact, think of it this way. What does your heart call Jesus? Uh, a friend of mine says that you can tell if somebody is a Christian simply by um, by, by, by what name their heart calls Jesus. Think of it like this. I can tell a lot about your relationship with me, about what you call me. When a telemarketer calls and I pick up the phone and they ask for a Mr. Gree R, 
I know they don't really know me. They're just reading my name off a script, and that's why they mispronounce it. Um, if somebody refers to me as Dr. Greer, I know that they've done a little research on my academic history, but, but they probably aren't really close to me because, because nobody calls me Dr. Greer. Um, if somebody pick up the phone and somebody says, Jay Dizzle, I know that this is probably a pretty good friend of mine because one of my close friends called me that. There are four people in the world who call me Daddy, and there's one person in the world who calls me Mega Man. My wife, Veronica. You see, I can tell a lot about your relationship to me simply by the names that you call me. The question is, what name does your heart call Jesus? Do you know Jesus as Emmanuel? Do you know him as wonderful counselor, as everlasting father, your redeemer, your restorer, your righteousness, your hope in heaven? By the way, I'm not asking if you believe those things are true of Jesus. I'm asking you if you have claimed them as your own. Are these the names that your heart gives to Jesus that they call out and trust in Jesus with? Again, remember John 1 12 that we looked at during that during our first session. It says, But to as many as received him, it was to them he gave the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Believing on his name means taking his names for yourself, taking what is promised in those names and believing that and grasping it and claiming it as yours. You see, Jesus is all of these things in his very nature, but he won't be them to you until you choose to receive him, until you believe on his name. This season is a bright sign pointing you to Jesus. Unto you a child is born. Unto you a son has been given. Will you receive him? Will you believe on his name? I think one of the things that really stood out to me in that when he was reading out of uh, talking about the I Am's out of Exodus 3 and that verse 8 in Exodus 3 when he said so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land it is a land flowing in milk and honey, a land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and um, Jebusites now live. But so I have come down, and that's what this season is all about. Jesus has come down to to represent God here on earth as God. And, and to lead us. And while I was sitting there, I was, I was, uh, I'm a little bit, again, I get off course sometimes of where I'm supposed to be at. But something hit me, and I wanted to read something pretty important to you. Out of Revelation 22, verse 1 Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of the prophecy written in this book. Remember that first candle was the prophecy candle. And here we are in the last chapter of the last uh, part of the New Testament. And I'm coming soon. He guarantees that again. Then in verse 12, he says, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all the people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Then in verse 16, he said, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you the message for the, church, for the churches. I am both the source of, da I am both, both, both the source of David and the heirs to, heirs to his throne. I am the bride and morning star. And then in verse 20, yes, I am coming soon. And so that's our reassurance. That's what this Advent is leading up to, that guarantee that we have. So 
J.D. showed us a few places in the Bible where God calls himself I am. I don't know if any of you have counted up to make sure there's 6,500 uses of I am in the Old Testament. That's for tomorrow. Uh, what? That's for tomorrow. That's for tomorrow. <laughs> so if anyone wants to prove him wrong, you can just check it out. What's well, really funny, he uses 6,500, but here in your notes it yeah, says 6,000. 6, yeah. I, 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 I looked it up in my other part and it said 6,500, and he says it on the thing, so I don't know what that's all about. And if so, you try to look it up, it's going to be, it's going to say Lord in here a lot of those, most of those times. Okay. It'll say Lord in all capital letters. Okay. That's what they're referring to because they wouldn't write, they would they wouldn't even write out of the in the, in full because they were trying to revere it, trying to be careful with it. Okay. So when it says Lord, that's what it is. Okay. So anytime it says Lord, it's actually saying I am. It's saying Yahweh. Yahweh. Is, Yahweh. Yes. Jehovah. Mm -hmm. God. I've I've heard that when they were transcribing it, when they would come to that word, they would take their quill and lay it down. They'd get a brand new quill, write the name. And then put that one down. They wouldn't use that quill for anything else except that one word. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I am seems like a strange name, but it teaches us that God is the one who takes care of us, mm -hmm. helps us and forgives us, and promises to be with us for all eternity. He is a source of uh, supply, or he is our source and supplying for our security and courage and strength and salvation. In what ways do you feel like you aren't enough? Or what do you feel like you need to be happy? I guess something I want to back up a little bit to is our sermon today and how Pastor was talking about how the Israelites just couldn't quite get it. And so they had to wander. They had to wander for 40 years. And then they still couldn't get it. So then they had to go into Babylon for 70 years. But they continued to wander. They continued to doubt. And now we're here with this promise, the actual promise. And most of us have taken that promise and that guarantee that we do have that salvation for Christ. So in what ways do you feel like you aren't, aren't enough? <laughs> It's in every way. Yeah, I was going to say. In every way. It's humbling. It's humbling to think as many things as I've done in my life that this guy's going to say, come on in. Well, the world, you see a lot of things where, I mean, you can you can get material like uh, shirts or plaques or buttons or whatever, you know. You are enough. And you, you know, I am enough. And you're... Mm -hmm. you're but for the Christian, that's never the message. You're not enough. Yeah. God, God is enough. You're not. We are. And we don't have to feel bad that we're not. Right. If we start feeling like we are, that's the danger zone. Mm -hmm. You know, every time I pray, I say to God, who am I that you love me so much? And I say that just about every time I pray because... That's the way I feel when I go before him. Is you know, I don't even a lot of times I don't understand how he approves me coming to him because I'm always in a mess when I do. Most of the time, not all the time. But uh, it's just awesome to feel the presence of him when you get that low. It feels so undeserved. Exactly, that's exactly. What he has exactly. To and that's you know it humbles you. It really does. I almost, I mean, I almost can't even say anything at times because I'm so. Well, like he was talking with his wife. When we got married, when we came together, everything I had was hers, everything she had was yeah. mine. When we come to God, we get everything to his, but what have we got to give him? Exactly. 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 It's kind of a, not balanced out anywhere close. No, no without that is a great analogy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other comments on this? You know, and I think this answer to that question, we've been talking a lot about what we're going to do when we get to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> I think this, again, it gets yeah. kind of get, it's back into that thing. Well, I'm going to be face down exactly. and in, in tears uh, and not even exactly. able to look up. You know, we're going to be in such awe 
that we're not going to be able to say nothing. <laughs> That's why I like that song so much, I can only imagine. Exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah. Because that's all you can, is imagine. Because <laughs> once we get there, we won't have to imagine. You know, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, probably, uh, probably more, either non-committed Christians, I guess, they're always the ones who want to say, well, I'm going to ask him why. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to, and that. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. I just, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be glad to be there. That's right. I'm going to be overjoyed. One good thing about it, when we get there, we're on. <laughs> yeah. There won't be no doubt. Yeah. It's going to be so. What's the, there's no words. I can't even imagine. I can't, I can't exactly. even imagine. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. Exactly. At least the song they can imagine. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. the song they can imagine, I can't imagine. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. I think once you get there, tell them you'll know. Exactly. Yeah, because we won't be able to say why. Yeah, no why. Yeah. Well, I mean, we see so much perfection in our life. We see things that God made for us to enjoy, the flowers to enjoy, trees to enjoy, We're animals that have our purpose. Uh, we see so many things, and we see the beauty of, of paintings and. All these great things that God has allowed people to do in our life that we've been able to share, but that's not even going to come close. No, no. That's not even going to... <laughs> that's what I was going to say. That's just a sample. Because <laughs> I, always, I always tell you, I always get amazed at where, how he, he, uh, he places things. You know, you might be in a remote area somewhere, and here's this beautiful wildflower just out in the middle of nowhere yep. for me to enjoy. And that's what we really need to be going through life with, being able to see God's great creation and enjoying that. So when you talk about seeing these things like a sunrise or a sunset, mm -hmm. or a bird on the wing, you know, whatever. And then I get to think back that Paul says, now we see through a glass darkly. If we're seeing all this beauty here, and we're seeing yeah. that through a dark lens of some kind. <laughs> wow. We can't yeah. imagine what how, how exactly. bright yes. and right. light it's going to be. Well, I don't even think we really know what colors are. Yeah. Uh, we know our eyes will be fixed, though, when we get yeah. to heaven. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so when we pray, we can sometimes ask only for the things we think we need to solve our problems, but forget to ask God to be our I am. In what ways can you ask God to help you with your problems and needs today? I don't know if it brings it up in here, but one thing that it gives me about the words I am, he uses the words I am. That's present tense. It's not I was. Hmm. It's not I'm going to be. But no matter where we are in history, whether I was five years old, 20 years old, or old now, <laughs> he's always in the present tense, I am right now for you. Well, I mean, I like his references in the New Testament. I'm just looking at them up, and we might want to just touch on them if we got some time. Somebody, while I'm looking, I'm, on, I'm doing 635 right now, but somebody look up John 7, 37 through 38. And I guess while you're there, you, well, you could just go ahead and, and run that line. I'll just ask if you're in John, uh, I'm going to start with 35, 635. And he talked about, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never, and I'm having trouble with the darkness here, uh, will never be hungry. Again, whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But somebody, if you got 37, 7, 37, 38, we'll read that for me, please. In John 6? John 7. John 7. Let somebody get 8, 12 ready in John. What was the verses again? 37? 37 and 38. Okay. Uh, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Okay. And then 8.12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 10, 9. And then somebody look up 11 right behind. Well, somebody look up 11. 10, 9. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. 
They will come and go freely and will go well find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them the riches that will sound like. Okay, 10 11. The thief comes only to steal. Oh, 10? Yeah. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 14, 6. <clears throat> John 14, 6, please. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, somebody look up. Second Peter one four. Somebody look up Ephesians three six. Someone look up Colossians one twenty seven. And then somebody look up John one twelve. So I need someone to look up Second Peter one four. Somebody got that? Somebody look up Ephesians three six. Okay. Somebody look up Colossians one twenty seven. Got it. And then John one twelve. And start with Second Peter one four. Second Peter one four. Yeah. But which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful nature. Okay, look up, who's got Ephesians 3, 6, read that. Okay. This mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs, together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1, 27. Colossians 1, 27. I haven't got somebody else to, I'm on the wrong page. Okay, yeah. okay I got it now. 127. Uh, let's see. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, and then John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. What can you do right now to trust God more with your whole life? What can you do now, right now, to trust God with more with your whole life? I just do by having total faith in Him. He takes, he takes my life constantly. He's always driving me to do everything that I do do. And I, mean, I feel like I'm getting on His nerves all day because I'm really <laughs> chatting with Him constantly, you know, all the time. He's the only friend I'm with all day sometimes, except for my dog or him or something. So I'm always chit chatting to Him. And I just feel like. He does for me constantly. Mm -hmm. It's not just once in a while I'll say something. It's I know I've, I've got to get on his nerves. <laughs> I mean, I, just, I don't know how he does it. Well, <laughs> for some of you men, I know that sometimes going to the, uh, you know, you get books to on how to fix stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes us men, you either tend to just look at the pictures. Mm -hmm. And then when you get all done, there's that one bolt left, and you wonder, where that bolt, where's that bolt supposed to be at? As long as it works, it's fine. As long as it works, it's fine. <laughs> that was excellent. That's the Basel way. And then they, <laughs> then they have Mark do it over. And then, and then after a while, then you decide, then you decide, well, maybe I ought to read the instructions. Yeah. Well, Pastor talked about the instructions today. And the instructions with, for our life is right here. And everything we need to know about life is right here. And if we could get this world to live by this book, what a great life. What, what, what a great world America. we'd have. What a great world we'd have. What, what was the question that she answered? How do we... What can you do right now to trust God more with your whole life? I think that probably we always have one thing that we know God wants us to do. And we don't have to... I mean, we need to study the Bible regularly, but we don't have to know everything it says. 
We just need to know the thing he wants us to do right now and do it. And then he'll show us the next thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we read a ton of the promises uh, and, and all these I am's and, and those are the promises. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, that's right. Did you know, Tom, we talk about trust a lot. But I think that's our biggest thing is trust in the Lord. I think that's our major thing is trusting him and believing and knowing that he will do what he says he will do. Because we're always people who have to see it happen. Where does doubt come from? <laughs> we enemy. all know where that comes from. The enemy. The enemy. The enemy, and that's what exactly what you're going up against. Yeah. you got an enemy that's out there working to try to counter exactly. everything that God has promised you. And because he couldn't be the boss, he tried, but he yeah. he, he never will be. And uh, but, but we he, still but have to figure out a way to get by that. Yeah, I know that's because it's not impossible. Because we keep our eyes on God. Yeah, and, and yeah. We yeah. Don't don't let that distract us. Yeah, no distractions. Well, I don't. I think I'm going to end right there uh, where we're at. Um, anything else about? This has been kind of a different Advent type of uh, <laughs> lessons you've been used to. Okay, go ahead, Kathy. Quick question. Um, in what ways can you ask God to help you with your problem, your needs today? You know, I instinctively this morning asked for the Lord's presence. And it's it's funny. It's not funny. I don't know for lack of a better word. But how the Holy Spirit shows up, you know, when you need him. And... I felt in the service today, and then this might sound morbid, but we went to put a wreath on my parents' grave, and we sang Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I just felt the presence of, of the Holy Spirit just surrounding me. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, he was there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? I well, think if, if you are trusting, if if you're trusting God, you're not worrying. You, have no, you don't worry if you're trusting God. because It's easy to say, I trust God, but then mm -hmm. worry and wonder about something else yeah. going on. So I think if we're trusting God, we can't worry about it. But we still things. do, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's, there's, there's those, yeah. 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 There's those yeah. signs that say, don't worry, give it to God, and go to sleep. I wish I could do that. <laughs> I get to sleep once in a while. Well, there's, you have to there's, do it over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. You find God to worry and do it again. <laughs> And there's always those people that are coming to your life, even though you think you got it figured out, and they're trying to tell you, they're putting some doubt into your mind. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, well, this can't work out that way. And so that's what it becomes. Anything else? So we know that we have, in fact, I always, my guys at work used to do, I was always talking about faith, hope, love, and joy. And in fact, I got a little thing on my desk that it says all those things. And uh, but that's what we're looking for. We learned that the first part of Advent is hope, the second, faith, joy, peace, and purity, which as far as I'm concerned is love, and it's the love that Jesus Christ gave up for us. Anything else? Last thoughts? Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the salvation that you've given us through your Son, Jesus Christ, for what the work that he did on the cross for us and the salvation he offers us, and nothing that we did, everything that he did. Father, we thank you that not only that was, you sent your Holy Spirit to indwell us, to guide us through our day, to help us fight some of the things we're even talking about right now, how the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but yet you've given us Holy Spirit to give us discernment on how to fight him off. Not only that, then you give us your Holy Word to study and grow in depth, to know what you, uh, how we can defeat the enemy. And the defeat the enemy starts with a belief in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we're so grateful for that. So this Advent season, this time that we're waiting on you to come, you have come through Bethlehem, now you're going to come again in the sky. And, Father, we're just waiting for that day to come, and, and we'll celebrate in, in greatness of what you're going to do for us. And so bless each one here as they go about their week. Uh, help us show the light of Advent as we go about our week. 
Help us to be, uh, show that faith and that love and that joy and that peace that we have, knowing that you are our Savior. So bless each one here as they go about. We ask it all in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.